Yeah. So it is uh, the morning of uh, <laughs> it's the morning of uh, uh, February fourth. It's uh, Phil or Kill. Uh, meet myself the financial acrobat and uh, ed Matz, the likable trader uh, <laughs> good morning or or uh, good afternoon or whatever ed. hi sorry um likable trader um i don't <laughs> mind not being liked i just want to um now this market really yeah so um, uh, good name good name for the show today feel or kill uh, because i feel like um uh, last 24 hours being killed a bit. I took some um, some hits. I'm well grumpy. There's um there's a great quote which um, I, uh, you know, we try and increasingly try and get better organised for this uh, this chat if you like uh, by putting some quotes out. But one I haven't got, but I actually quoted it on the weekend um, from a guy called Tom Baldwin. The best traders have no ego. You have to swallow your pride and get out of the losses. Mm. And, and move on basically to the next trade. So I mean, losses and um, stops are an integral part of trading. In order to um, talk about preserving your capital, you have to, um, you know, I have to work out not only uh, where you're going to put your stops. I always, always have a stop uh, on a trade before I, I, I end, well, as as before I enter it, I know where it is. But as I enter it, I place the stop. There's no, it's impossible for me to take a trade without a stop. Pretty much, um, and you know, and, and the nature of the game is you're not going to get everything right, so you have to uh, take the losses and be prepared. We talked before about how you take those losses. Um, some, you know, I write the the position off before as I take it, so it shouldn't have a dent. Um, but what what I find grueling about, you know, I've got the end crosses wrong. Um, what I found grueling is, is you know, well, you, it's easy in retrospect, always easy in retrospect, is um, I didn't see something that I, I now see. Um, I didn't anticipate the level of volatility in the market. Fun, really, because last Monday we spoke about um, the whole concept of volatility and it being a volatile day. And um, can you actually, I'm going to change things around a bit, can you put up the, uh, the chart of the Turkish Lira? I can, certainly. I was going to put up the chart of yesterday's e -minis, but here you go, sir. Yesterday's what? Uh, e -minis, futures. Oh, yeah, yeah. So. I don't know if people can... Um. Uh, it's, it's a little bit off, but we can see the volatility. So the volatility is clear, even though the we chart We saw is... the gap down. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh, what was it? Monday's gap down. Was it yeah. last Monday's gap down on and interest rate hike and, and stuff like that? Um, that is very, very revealing, and uh, we talked about it when it, you know after it happened, and saying this market is going to go sideways, it's dead, and uh, that was being my problem is not anticipating the level of volatility in this market, and the reason is uh, hoisted by my own petard because I can see the market moving in steps, it is not all moving together, you know, you, you trade, you know, you trade the. Uh, and S&Ps and the Dow together and you know they get a little bit out of sync but pretty much moving in line that's to be expected but other markets generally in the scheme of things they're moving step by step by step and what really annoys me about this chart is I and do you remember before it happened I was saying it looks like it got a spike down um, and then it should come back in that 220 to 240 range and in fact it went quite a bit lower than 220 and then recovered that should have been a warning sign there's a lot more volatility in the tail the fat tail ironically <clears throat> uh, the level of volatility in the last legs of the move has been much higher um, partly I think because the nature of the market is one driven by by sentiment you got the you know the 1929 crash uh, context you've got um, some things like Argentina going on, you've got some real potential massive risks out there. So the moves are being overextended. Yeah, I tweeted yesterday that um, you know, it's like when I sold um, the Dow was uh, 58, uh, 15,800 on, on Friday. That um, it had gone 50 points more than, it, than, I, than I imagined it would. And the same thing yesterday 
it's it, the market continues to overshoot at its levels where there's volatility where something like dax isn't you know is being pushed a bit more than it than you could have expected it to be but it's not quite so so volatile but that's what is annoying me if you go back to that turkish lira chart we are trading in that gap and that's what for someone who um you know i i do i you know, I, I, it's called fractals. I call call them fractals. They are fractals about where history repeats itself. But we all, whether you believe in fractals or, or, or not, however you trade, we all rely on history. We all rely on what the market tends to do, likes to do, and that's based on what it's done, as a clue for what it's likely to do next. And the problem, sorry, with that chart is the gap. Is It didn't trade. I mean... It didn't trade because the Turkish lira arguably wasn't wasn't open, and yet the S and P's yesterday and, and some of the and the yen crosses are open and they're trading it. So it's harder to make the analogy. Um, can you switch to cable? Actually, have a look at cable. I just wanted to show when you mentioned S and P yesterday, that was a gruesome hit uh, after the ISM, and that was based off of sound. Uh, that was based off of uh, sound reasoning. So um, the sell-off yesterday. What what do you just want to on on a personal note? What do you think about the sell-off? Uh, when I saw the number, I just thought this was going to be a relentless day, and it was. I mean, it was. Uh, well, you're night. wiser than me because I didn't think it was going to be relentless. In fact, that's my the point I'm making is, and why I'm annoyed is not my views wrong because um, you know it's pretty much intact in in concept. Uh, the levels are wrong, and the levels are wrong because of the volatility in the market, and that's what I haven't, you know, having talked and seen. And I guess because I saw something like the Turkish lira going back, I thought the volatility would be subdued and not increased or maintained, and that's the problem with um, what we're seeing. I mean, if you take something like cable, I mean, cable has been a classic. Uh, and the other thing about, let me say, one thing about the volatility is it's taking out stops. It is very hard to hold a position in this market. I think if unless you have, it's a conviction trade, unless you're able to time your entry so well that an immaculate entry that you're not going to have to sit and try and sit through a position. Um, you know, if you can sell the rally where at the right level like 5800 the other day and, and run it, then fine, no problem. But if you you know if you try and go in the other way, you can't hold the position because it's it is relentless. If you see something like cable, I mean the euro dollar is doing the same thing. Is just where are the levels, where are the stops in the market, and it's going for them. And cable, what did cable do? I mean, cable went through the previous low, one sixty three, fifteen, sixty two, sixty, and then numbers come out, and how you left, it's back up. Go and look at January the seventeenth. What did cable do on retail sales? Went to new low took the stops, retail sales came out, 140 points higher, how you left. And that's the nature of this market. So it's, it's you've got to be anticipate the move and then position in order to have the right risk return. And that's the, um, that's the, the difference, is you have to time the trade right and, and to be able to and get it right. And that's why a trade isn't a view, because it's easy. It's easy to have a view. It's not necessarily easy to have the right view, but how you time the trade. You know, I, you can be of the opinion like me that um, it is right to look for a level to buy um, the stock stock market. But if you you know you get the timing wrong and the risk return, where's the like the DAX now aren't that far away from the previous major low below nine thousand, so that's not a bad place you know, for me to buy against. The risk return is now starting to come back. Other, you know, otherwise, how do you trade it? If the risk return is too wide and you're fighting a market because you think it's right to position, then your probability isn't necessarily as high as you would like, then it's not a trade. I mean, I, I, but do you think part of the reason for this is that the market is changing in nature in a bit? Where we, uh, we, we've, uh, for, a, for a span of year, a few years, we got used to the risk on, risk off market and uh, things were highly correlated and... Um, it was very hard to make any kind of relative place. You just had to, you had to judge, judge the level of risk, I guess, in order to position. And then we saw risk on, risk off go off permanently. And we saw things diverge much more. And um, uh, as of late, it seems that uh, the market is 
maybe changing shape a little bit. I, I'm not. That's uh, what people said this time last year. Maybe maybe January is the. the well, no, no. Back. I'm saying it's changing shape into. Uh, it's changing into being uh, significantly more volatile, and uh, volatility uh, uh, creates all kinds of uh, disruptions. Where uh, all I'm saying is you have to be you have to be aware of an ever changing market. And I'm just like sensing off here when you can have like after having a steady growth for a lot of uh, assets for span of a year and people made incredible returns and now you're seeing these blips and you're seeing these like it's almost like symptoms of something wrong and uh, you're seeing like uh, oh wait there, there goes there goes Nikkei there goes Emini there you know what I mean it's there's something happening there is a subtle shift right now I don't think uh, I think the scale of the, the decline potentially a corrective decline We've seen is well by ne necessary is corrected because Dow's not going to zero, is it? Um, but the scale of the decline we've seen is a little bit out of sync with the previous ones. We've seen it's larger, but yeah. that, I don't think it fundamentally changes the nature. You know, it's not hit what people the ten percent that people would define as a bear market, which I think is bizarre. Fourteen percent. Yeah, I, mean, I think the process. I think the labeling. You know, and therefore the impact that has on sentiment. You almost think. The Dow probably need, and the S&Ps need to go 10% for people to call it a bear market, and then that's when it will rally. But you know, that's just being contrarian, almost for the sake of being contrarian. Um, I don't think the nature of the markets changed. It's still very much a risk market. The correlations there, you know, the yen is getting pretty strong on, on the back of um, assets, global assets coming off. Um, you've seen, we've seen in January um, again, we've seen correlations break break down. Which maybe is a warning sign that you know something like this was was around the corner. Um, I don't. Uh, it's difficult when you're so close to something. It's sometimes difficult to. But I don't see. You know, I'm not talking about the market's direction. I'm talking about the nature of the market. I don't see the nature of the market changing. I think this is. Oh, it goes back to that Taleb point. You know, volatility is necessary for stability. The yeah, read his book actually. This looks for oh, which which other books? Anti fragility. <laughs> Possible, is it? No, neither is a, a coffee cup. But um, uh, if you put up, um, you got a um, Paul Tudor Jones picture of his house. You put a picture of Paul Tudor Jones's house. Yes. Those people who want goals to uh, inspire them. I should put that full screen. One second. There you go. Oof. Which uh, which of the houses is that? Is that the one in the? Um, I don't know. I haven't been to his house. It's yeah. in the. Uh, it's just like some. It's Greenwich, isn't it? Somewhere like that. Yeah, isn't it's, it in it's Connecticut? A, well, it's got a big. Uh, I think it's got a big like a farm or something. somewhere. I don't remember. So this is the the one in Greenwich, okay? Oh, uh, I I don't know, but it looks kind of cool. I had a house, um, not similar. It's not on that scale, but similar. Type of um, a veranda on the front that uh, I built on the front, front but anyway. Um, because I, I do like that house, I like the scene. I, I kind of like, um, you know, he's talking about uh, long, you have long term views, but uh, doesn't necessarily translate into a, um, a position. If you can't uh, get into the position and stay with a position that and ride it as a winner, then you know, you um, he's, he was a great believer, as I am, that you need to get out and, and look to. To reposition, and you keep doing that until you think you can establish yourself on the right side of it. And it's something that you know to choose uh, some another trader, Jesse Livermore. He was a great believer in reading the tape or following the tape. And if you can't hold a position, like I, I haven't been able to hold a position in this um, stock market decline, probably thankfully because I'd be well out of money because um, I keep trying to buy it, you know, sell it, sell it for. I think it's going for the lows again. Look, expecting it to hold 50 points down, I'll take a few points out of that decline. Then, you know, then it goes through the low, and the timing is always wrong. Um, if you can't establish the position, that's telling the tape is something. The market's telling me something, and it's telling me that there's, there's quite significant liquidation, and it's quite relentless. Doesn't mean the, the concept, the view is wrong. A view is not necessarily a trade, unless it starts to give me levels that I can take the view that 
that my abort level is so you know so solid so close to the level where i am that risk of turn trade warrants you know actually going to the market and buying with that stop then it's it's always exploratory for me it's a question of establishing the right risk return and the probability and so the fact that you may think a market's going up doesn't necessarily mean it's the right market to trade you yeah. could have thought today um, it's like today both euro dollar and cable in the last 24 48 hours looked like they would break the lows and come back so you know you buy it no no thank you i'm, I'm actually short and running those in two markets that they're playing uh, strangely markets i'm looking for volatility in that we haven't seen a huge amount of volatility in but they're still working in the um uh, the, the right the right direction can we talk about the bubble uh our bubble chart or our bubble thing are you seeing that bubbles are dissipating? Are you seeing bubbles anywhere? No, 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 bubbles don't. You, um, there's always a good phrase, and I'm not going to repeat. It's, it's spelled WTF. That, when you're in a bubble, that's what you, is the immediate sentiment. Do you remember when Bitcoin went yeah. over, uh, when it went into 1200 plus, yeah? What's that's, the... That's a, that's... That's prof more profound than you think, what you're just saying. Why? That's how you know you're in a bubble, when that's your only reaction. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, uh, there are other ways of saying it. It's irrational exuberance. is a polite Greenspan term. But it's just like, you know, you just, you just don't. Gold, 1975 plus, you know, levels like that. Nikkei, when they went monster. Um, uh, I, uh, there's something actually I'm, I'm doing a presentation tomorrow uh, uh, with Ashraf uh, at City Index, uh, so I'm going to cover, um, hope to cover some of the bubbles. So I've got a really cool chart that that would just freak people out. But it's it's drawing analogies, comparisons of bubbles. Yeah. How you can uh, bubbles fairly obvious, <laughs> always obvious after that. But I remember, you know, people uh, the day that Bitcoin. I mean, it's the most recent obvious example. That's why it's so vivid in one's memory, even though I don't trade the that thing maybe that's why it's more vivid um because i wasn't living it as such but the it was when it was breaking through 500 people saying oh it's this stupid the next thing you know it's above 12 it's it's above a thousand and there's above a thousand people say it's above a thousand then it's above 1200 and then just just wow whoa and then everyone starts talking maybe this is a, you know whatever the funny and, thing and was thing, uh yeah but the bubble bursts J uh, joe it's, weisenthal at the uh, business insider like literally on the top tick of that uh, bubble, went out saying that I was wrong about Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, what was it? Henry and it's always what, like uh, the last bear just surrenders and then you go down again. But what do you think about Bitcoin? We mentioned, we touched upon it a few times, but you haven't said much recently. It's well, I don't, I'm not interested in Bitcoin, yeah? I mean, Bitcoin, when Bitcoin's been around, for two reasons I'm not interested in Bitcoin. Bitcoin needs to be around for a while to establish integrity i don't think necessarily lacking integrity but so i can trust that it's going to be around tomorrow for me to trade it yeah. but i don't have that level of trust it needs to be around for a while to do that and if it's a bubble that's burst i suspect the the heat the air that's gone out of the bubble doesn't mean it's going to collapse to zero doesn't mean it's going away um it can just trade like um i like the nick i did for 10 years and you know everyone will talk you know bitcoin is kind of cool you do that and it's not a market to trade it's not exciting anymore oh. so i don't see the volatility in bitcoin anymore because the bubbles burst yeah. and so therefore the reasons for in fact the, this is the irony about bitcoin for me is it needs to lose its volatility before it to establish itself as a long-term proposition because Bitcoin is fashioned, it's not fashioned as a speculative vehicle. Bitcoin's being fashioned as a means to an end, as a means of exchange that is not going to be driven by central bank policy. It's a means of doing business. Now, you're not going to do business that some, with something that moves 20% on a whim in 24 hours because, you know, you put together a deal, you put it through, and next thing you know, it's 20%. Even the uh, the you know the the drug peddlers I'm thinking are going to balk at losing twenty percent in twenty four hours um, <laughs> on the on the back of a of the speculative whim. So Bitcoin needs to die a death in a range and establish itself as a means of an exchange for a period of time, whatever you know, like two years or something like that, whatever. 
for it to to become a sensible currency market. And then, you know, but that's saying it's of no interest as a trading vehicle, as a speculative vehicle. And so I've got no interest in it. You know, knock on my door in two years' time. Come back later. Um, so that's why I'm not talking about Bitcoin um, because I, it was fascinating. And it is fascinating, I think, as a concept, as a as an alternative to central to central bank driven currencies. But it's another bubble. Well, you that's... can regulate. I mean, the problem is you can kill it with a with a single swipe. I mean, the DOJ is now trying to regulate it. At least, maybe not going out saying it very publicly, but clearly there is a there is a want to regulate it, and then it it becomes uh, becomes uninteresting. Who's trying to regulate it? The DOJ is uh, hitting um, hitting some of the um, of the parties, and then then you're in trouble if if uh, like you you say you're talking about uh, money transfer being easy and free and whatever, but all these things are established concepts. It's not like people are going to let you undercut it f just like that. And I, I recently had to transfer quite a bit of money uh, using uh, one of these like established old services where. Uh, I actually don't remember what it's called, but one of these like money money transfers because you need money in two hours, and um, and that was great. I mean, it's expensive, but you can trust it. If I would use Bitcoin, and twenty percent would be gone by the time I was taking it out, that's not good. That's not a good money transfer system at all. So volatility kills that side of it, and then uh, the regulation kind of kills the trading side of it. So yeah, that's my two cents on that. Yeah. No, Do you, you want to get into uh, to some of the charts you have here? Yeah. Um, so my my point is is have we have we see, have we seen a bubble burst uh, through the Christmas period on New Year's on New Year's with the stock markets? And it certainly wasn't a WTF uh, scale bubble burst. You know, there's been there's been. Um, Sizable corrections, Ray, that have started similar to this. Um, you know, you look at um, 2000, it was a pretty big correction. It was kind of a rounded, you know, started this similar way. Um, There's a good song highlighted that analogy around the trip before we got into the even that final um, burst high in the stock market. But I don't think there's, this is bubble territory. There's a number of reasons why, but not least because I haven't. I don't really think it's been on the scale where people just, you know, it hasn't been on that 20% that Bitcoin, what the proverbial scale yet. Yeah, but did you want, so uh, let's put in a situation. If, uh, whatever, let's look. I mean, this is what I would do is, is, is when I get a little bit lost, like the scale of this move, uh, you know, I'm annoyed with myself for not anticipating the volatility because I had a, a template right in front of me in the form of the Turkish lira. Um, you know, uh, and I, I could see, you know, with the DAX, you could see the three, 400 point drop. Now that hasn't, arguably, strangely, that hasn't really um, sustained or maintained that level of volatility. But if, um, so Let's look at some other templates. How does the um, how does the S and P decline? How does it drop? And then you know, that that for me is kind of interesting because that's like when I get lost, particularly I, I go back to history where I think it may be. I look at other things. I look at the declines and say, well, are there any clues in what it likes to do? You know, yeah. And there are. You know, you can see there. I've. I don't know if everyone can see all those charts there, but I, all they yeah, see it close change, enough. If you but, change it to 720p, you can see it's fine. I mean, you probably can't see it on your Skype, but it's fine going out. But you, um, do you think they're similar? Do you see any parallels there? That it's going to bounce? Or do you think it's, they look similar? Hmm. I mean, if you can see and uh, draw the comparisons, I think there's a... Uh... I don't know. You tell me. I don't, I'm not sure, to be honest. Maybe the current one and the th and the third one, maybe. There are there are striking similarities, I think, uh, between the way it's trading. There are striking similarities. Oh, it's really ironic. Striking similarities between the current S and P decline and that Turkish lira chart as well. That's my point. It's this last leg down in the S and P has been that last leg in the uh, Turkish lira. Whereas so you, yesterday you the last, it was trade. So you think that the S and P move is the gap down? 
Yeah, the problem is I don't have the price action. <laughs> so I, I didn't live it, didn't see it, don't have a chart of it. Um, and that, you know, they can go another 100 points and make no difference whatsoever to that conceptual comparison. Um, the I was looking for, what was the low on the Turkish lira? Because you know, I was looking for 220 and, and it went whack. Yeah. You know, it went significantly lower than that. And the same with this, this market. So, but it needs, the one thing is it needs to stabilize. Now, if you go back to the DAX chart, this is a good example why necessarily a trade isn't a view, or, or but a, a view can be, a, a view isn't necessarily a trade, but a, a trade actually, you can trade without a view uh, because there are levels in markets. Um, if you notice, uh, one thing that is did previously, if you draw the comparison, it's what's called a Mandelbrot, or what I coined as the phrase Mandelbrot, it's where the price action is very similar to itself in different in previous instances. It's repeating the same price action. Um, is that what was quite clear is the market stabilized before. Um, you can see, so saying basically, it needs to stabilize. I mean, it started, what was I, I tweeted this earlier, that how the DAX. Seven out of the last nine days, the DAX has started strong, relatively strong, compared to where it was a few hours before that, and then has sold off. Seven out of nine days, it's sold off, which it's trying to do now. So quite important then to this whole market, because I think DAX is a reflection. It hasn't got the same level of volatility, but it does reflect the, uh, the risk on, if you like, risk off situation. It is showing that the market needs to stabilize. Now, you know, you can try like me, if you're like me, you know, you try and position, pick the, get the level and try and run it and you get catch a rally, then you trade around that and you minimize your, your loss or even you get break even stops and stuff like that to try and hold a position and it doesn't work. Or you can wait to see it stabilize and then break back up. And then again, you've got the green circle, it stabilizes. We need to see that stability. So that's... That is not the same as saying it's going down until it goes up. That's actually saying the market needs to stop going down to do two things, or three things, actually. The first is to instill a lack of momentum on the downside to say that things aren't. And then you start to get divergence, a lack of breadth, and things are, are clearly, um, there's, not a, there's a sense that things aren't quite as bad, that it may be bottoming out, you don't know. Maybe people start looking for the one final low they always do at the bottom. Um, and then you get that type of sentiment. And, and then it breaks back up. And then you, again, they'll be looking for the final low. And that's where the green, that's where the green, the trade, from a safer trader point of view, is in the green circle. When it brings, comes back down, you've got a very, you know, presents itself with a risk return opportunity. And that's once you've got the probability instilled by the, you know, the, the stability, but you've also got your parameters, you've got a risk return. That is a trade. Rather than just saying it's overdone, I mean, um, which I've thought for the last, seems like an eternity actually now, but because it's uh, uh, one day in this uh, volatile market, it's, it's like a week normally, uh, it feels it. But once you, rather than just buy into it and trying to pick your levels, um, it's, you know, it's the Jesse Livermore approach is to let the market prove itself and then you can join it. So, the view is not necessarily uh, a trade. Um, so there's, you know, there's, there's several opportunities that the DAX is presenting itself. Um, and uh, you kind of think the market's going to try, what has the market done every day? The market starts relatively strong and sells off. And every day it's gone, it's carried on going. Whereas the cycle, the markets typically, particularly in New York, has a cycle that, you know, if it sells off, it tends to stop after about 90, 60 to 90 minutes, the tick-tock, what I would call the tick-tock cycle, then establish a base or a top if it's the other way around, and then come off again. The market hasn't done that. So it needs to start doing that in order for, to say it's reversing. So I imagine the market will do what it normally does. It will bid, uh, it will buy it back up into the New York Open and then try and sell it off and then try and establish the low. Once it starts to break a pattern, 
well, markets are monotonous almost how uh, how they tend to trade because people recognize that like the DAX open is strong. So I made money yesterday selling the DAX on the open. So I'm going to sell the open or strength today. And they do the same thing because that's what pays the bill because that's what's successful. And so when it starts to do that, when it stops doing that, it does, it does two things. One, it confuses people, but it also is a signal that the pattern is breaking. And if the pattern is associated with a downtrend, then it's possible that the downtrend is breaking or finish or finished itself. You look for patterns. The same with um, centers. You know, you typically find one center will drive a market, and it's New York, uh, and it's focused in the, in Japan. Uh, basically, uh, it seems to me that the uh, New York is killing um, Japan. <laughs> That's what it feels like. But once, so that's the pattern. When that pattern breaks, when New York becomes a center that buys it, or let's say, um, you know, you find that Europe isn't taking part and has done previously. Once you find those key ingredients breaking, what I describe as key drivers, then you know the the pattern is trading, and therefore the trend may be changing. Um, it's whatever drives a market. Find it and then and, and pursue it relentlessly. What do you think about using a little bit different approaches to um, to measuring sentiment? What if you? What if ultra bullish people turn bearish? Oh yeah, yeah. But not. Did yeah. you read Howard Linson's blog yesterday? Well, is he very bearish now? No, it's just interesting because he is uh, possibly the most optimistic person I've ever met in my life. And I think you have to be kind of that when you're uh, a venture capitalist. Uh, and this was his blog yesterday. It's called, uh, if, you, if you switch this to 720p, you can actually read it in the video. But it's called, uh, what if today was the last great day to sell stocks? He's having this odd chart he puts up here, which is uh, seeing some level comparisons between S&P and VIX. Uh, I mean, I don't understand why, why that would matter because it's all about scaling. You can scale it to, f to fit perfectly, but... Uh, 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 aren't you right? Aren't you right? Oh, wow. But... No, 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 uh, no, no just... that, that point. I mean, the, um, I don't, again, I don't want to master class on fractals, but yeah, cut me a break on, on scaling. Yeah, I mean, um, put, up, put up a historic 1929 Dow chart and put the current chart next to it and and just put them next to each other, and they're quite quite different. But yeah, exactly. That's, that's, and they're, they're quite. But but that's that's beso I mean that that's one point here. So he doesn't use that. He just uses data almost like a graphic. But he's just saying uh, his because he's a trend follower, so he has to watch for trends. And he's saying like his new positions are getting stopped out. He's already being stopped out of a bunch of positions, which I know he's been in for a long time, and uh, the. What, 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 how would you describe, what would you expect to see in a healthy, talking about healthy and Taleb and anti-fragility again, healthy corrections? When your market exactly is 30%, is it reasonable to expect a 10% correction at some point? Yeah, of course. I'm just saying the mentality no, so people So if you shifts. buy, you know, if he's a trend follower, to establish the trend, one imagines you're going to miss the first 10%, get in around 15%, maybe some stocks be around 10%, and then you get a 10% correction. And if your stocks are break even, you know, or you're back to your levels, are you? That's the nature of a, that's why I'm a swing trader, because by nature, because I don't want to see it come back to my, to my, my level. Um, and, you know, sorry to talk through him and how at this point. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, come on, the uh, Rubini, Nouria Rubini, the biggest bear ever walked the planet, went bullish, uh, you know, through the Christmas period on the stock market. If yeah. there was ever, you know, I, I mentioned at the time, the one big why for, for any bull out there is the biggest bear on the planet's turned bullish. Um, so, yeah, definitely. But that's a reflection. It seemed a Bitcoin, there were people, you know, as you mentioned, uh, people flipping, going bullish, or, or putting their hands up, saying "sorry, I, I, I got it wrong," whatever, whatever they, you know, you want to use as a reflection of of the sentiment shifts. Sentiment shift is different to positions, though, and that is the when you look at some of the great indicators, you know, you, you follow. You can put, do this if you follow sentiment. You trade solely on sentiment, and you know, you'll do well. And then there will come a period when you'll get buried. 
And, yeah. and that's the most instructive moment for any anyone, quite frankly, when they lose money to go back and assess why they. That's why I'm talking the way I am today about missing the volatility, but to go back and recognise what's changed. And the simple thing, reason is, is because sentiment does not translate proportionally into positions in the market directly. The, the, the best example of that is um, is the yen in the last two years. When the market was breaking up through 80, back through 80, 81 levels like that, the market was bullish on dollar-yen. They were bearish on the yen. And so if you were a sentiment trader, then based on that, you would say the market's toppish. And yet it went up and up and up. And the simple reason is because the positions, people didn't have the positions. And those people who didn't have the positions said it's gone too far, tried to selling it, and then they end up stopping up higher. So they actually, and then they drive the price higher. And then you get the people who actually want to be long but haven't got it, who then um, want to buy it, and then they all they end up doing is buying it too high, and they they help fuel the rally as well. And that's why you don't see the straight line because expectations do not translate directly, um, and sentiment does not translate directly into positions. So to go back to Howard's point, Howard's, you know, he's saying, "Is was this the last great day to sell stock?" No. Um, He's saying that because he's finding his long positions are out of, um, uh, you know, are getting stopped out. Yeah. But he's not short. So maybe well, that's, maybe about that's the point. Maybe, you know, the market, it. there are people still like myself uh, who are looking for a bottom. Um, but this is a good indicator for you. The SOC Gen sentiment indicator. Um, it's uh, approaching lows from last summer. And... Uh, uh, this is proven to be uh, a fairly lagging indicator in the past. I don't particularly like this much. Uh, it's a very, uh, basically, it's another way of, of uh, it's like inverse, uh, inverse volatility. So you're saying the market's bearish, yeah? Yeah, which is a good time to buy. So yeah, but it would be simple. interesting to see. Well, I mean, again, again, translating, and, th and this is my problem going back through, you know, my own post-mortem as to why I took a, a couple of hits is, you know, and it's the level of volatility. You look at that. It's by, like buying an RSI. You know, it's at the bottom. It's the buy signal. You buy it and then whack the tail. The volatility in the tail is the killer. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I'm just saying so you could as be, a starting you know, point. Yeah, and, you know, next month when the market's higher, say, um, and you find that's you know, quite clearly was an indicator, quite clearly. Um, so you know, Howard saying last great day to 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 sell. Well, it's like the um, you know people who will cite the 1920. You know, if it turns into be the major out, they'll cite the 1929 example. What they won't talk about is how you got that last five ten percent as people you know after people said it was 1929, you got the ramp to the upside, that tail tail. Um, and it's the tail that that kills. It's not the. Um, and again, that's why the difference between a view and a, and a trade. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And uh, um, no, it, I, 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 I respect the, the the field that it's not my strength deeply. But looking for these like simple contrarian indicators is also interesting, uh, almost like an intellectual exercise. Yeah, well, again, it's the something. same point. It's this sharp, good analysis. You know, and there are various ways of of um, oh, of using sentiment indicators. You know, Barron's fifteen thousand Dow was topish. Um, <laughs> well, it's interesting. What I've noticed of like this is more. Um, it's a difficult point to to back up, but I've noticed when a lot of commentators. You know, uh, come out and say, "Oh, this is." Start talking about the low of the day. You know, when you start seeing the FT journalists start saying uh, the markets, uh, you know, falling out of bed or whatever. When they highlight it, what tends to happen? It tends to carry on a little bit, and then it ramps. It wipes out that entire decline, and then the next day it goes again, almost as if they've highlighted it. So people have jumped on, I don't think this is the case, but it's almost as if people have jumped on the back of that or they're reflecting the sentiment that pushes it lower and it goes because the market's gone overdone 
because that's when they decided to open their mouths and there were chases. And then it's like the people have picked up the dentist, the Belgian dentist, no disrespect to Belgian dentists, is how I always think of those. <laughs> what? An expression about Belgian dentists. Seems the, to be, when the Belgian it. dentists are in the market, you know it's, it's, the, it's the tail end. Um, <laughs> why Belgian? Don't ask me why, it's just... Um, I, I'm, I'm sure there are lots of, you know, caricatures, Mrs. Wano, uh, Wantanabe and, oh, and yeah. people like that, you know, there's those type of... But it's when the Belgian dentists are in the market that you know the tale. And that's <laughs> when they've read the FT guys talking. They go and thinking, this is falling apart. This is the last great day to sell stocks or whatever. You know, whoever, whatever. Then that's the form. The problem, Sveri, is, is differentiating that between... People are saying it's going to fall apart, as some people have been from the very top. And how do you differentiate? Well, you differentiate by knowing the impact on positions and how the trades move. And that's why not just sentiment is a good indicator, but how sentiment is reflecting positions in the market. So don't ever get fooled by that one. I mean, I can go off on one about um, expectations and doubly augmented expectations and triple what I call triple whammies. How about this? Is that well, in the case of the yen, what we saw was the market thinking it's gone up so much, the market must be long, therefore they will people sold. The market wasn't long because everyone thought the same thing, so all they ended up doing was stopping out higher up. And then there's the people who think that, who then buy on the back of it that brings it back down. I mean, that's that's when you start in putting levels of expectations on top of level of expectations. It comes into the sphere of game theory and gets so complicated, you think, why did I ever bother? And that's, that begs another question. Um, but, Do you, you think know, the life of a trader is a good life? Yeah. Is it? It's no, a very stressful life. The life of a trader... You get ups and downs. I mean, uh, it's it's it's, it's um, vivid. Yeah, <laughs> if you want to experience things in a vivid way, then yeah. But it's it's a good. Um, I love markets. I love uh, trading. And one reason is is because I don't think you ever stop improving. There's always. It's not like you know I've done it. Done. I mean, I never think I've done that. You know I. You get to a point where trading should be boring. You're disciplined, so disciplined that you take emotion out of it, that it's a process, and then it's dull. You know, you don't want to get up in the morning. I never experienced that. You know, I get pain. I experience, you know, when I, I get things wrong and lose money, I, I hurt. You know, yeah. it's not supposed to. It doesn't affect how I trade, but it still hurts, which motivates me not to do it again. Yeah, next time, next time, I'm not going to do that, you know, and that's what I've got to take on, on board, which is, you know, I think I'm, I'm forever improving in, in how I approach markets. And I think generally my profit, um, my profit stream reflects, you know, my, my trades re reflect that. Um, is it good? Is it even? Is it in danger? It's always a danger of getting too clever. Yeah. Uh, too sophisticated, um, and and you know it's the point about reading expectations, uh, triply augmented expectations. It's kind of academically interesting, and it has uh, a, uh, has a use like once every five years or something, once every two years. Uh, some of these forms of analysis, like bubble, how often do you going to use a bubble analysis on a on a euro dollar chart? Have has there ever been an opportunity on euro um, to use a bubble chart? No. So don't use it, yeah. <laughs> courses for courses. Yeah. Um, but it's the question is is the volatility. Uh, I've said this before. Um, predicting picking direction is not as hard as picking volatility. Uh, and I don't mean the level implied volatility in an options chart. I mean how, the extent to which a market can move, will move. It's your fat tails again. And the fat tails seem to be in the tails. I'm hoping in the tails that we're seeing the big moves the last 24, 40 hours in the tail end that you know means you can't hold the position, but it might be right to to trade on the back of it. The market will show. But this week we have uh, some big we stuff. We have two events, right? 
Isn't it both ECB and Bank of England? Am I yeah, right? you would think. This is. Uh, I was thinking this through that you would think with event risk hitting the market that the market would be inclined to slow and stop. Yeah, the ECB is going to come out and say something. Well, you know, are they going to Might lower rates? Though. When are they going to do it, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Um, that's going to be my two circles on the DAX, isn't it? If it stops the market falling. But then if the DAX is being driven to a lesser extent by the S&P, then is the S&P going to stop falling on the back of the ECB? No. But if the DAX does, and maybe that's why the DAX is lagging now, and, and will, you know, once you've got ECB out of the way, it'll feel in a position to, to dump. But at the moment, the way my chart stands, the stability that the ECB may instill into the market would be the conditions for that, that fractal to kick in and work, and therefore would say the market will, will turn. Why is the DAX uh, lagging almost the entire Europe today? Uh, why? Um, yes. I mean, I, maybe it's a stupid why question. Is, because is there a uh, because the the brand, it, it's a twofold market. It, it's two centers. It, it's New York and Japan that are the two hot areas in this market you know you've got emerging markets that are not on the fringe well they literally are on the fringe but they, they are a bit have been an issue but at the moment this whole question is about new york the overvaluation of a stock market arguably and taper and then the fallout in japan because the japan has been such a driver and and yen reflecting risk off and the nikkei uh, going further than other markets and, and coming back into to alliance. So it's Japan and the US. So the DAX, you know, the DAX arguably didn't go as high as markets like the Nikkei or even the States, and therefore it's, it's got lets to retrace. You know, I can give you good technical reasons because the DAX is still, all these markets are still maintaining the territory of their bull markets. And there's, there's nothing that's out there at the moment that says or can confirm that it, these are major turnarounds. And the DAX, you know, I, I talked about the concept of uh, consolidation. You know, the DAX is back down to the previous corrective lows. It was, um, uh, you know, but just below nine thousand. It was last time. So it's getting, and therefore it's going to attract buyers. So that will support it in itself. So I don't think um, Europe has been the focus, uh, or likely to be the focus. It's all about Japan and the states at the moment. Uh, which is interesting when you look at some of these, uh, some of these, you know, ex-famous or famous traders, market wizards, as um, as the book describes them. Tom Baldwin, um, going back, the very best traders have no ego, have yeah. to swallow your pride and, and swallow your losses, and and taking that approach is to have protect your capital, have stop losses, take the losses when you're wrong. Um, but there's a guy who made a serious amount of money. Interesting, interesting background to Tom Baldwin. Agriculture, I think he was. Went to college. That's what he was going to do. Then so his friend told him about trading. He then took a course in training, trading, and then ended up being the biggest mover of the bond market, U.S. bond market. I think, for, well, ostensibly, uh, he was a big name in the pits. Never bond heard of that name before. I tried to find his picture, but I can only find some actor guy from. Uh... Uh, the TV show 4400. So I don't think it, it was trading 60,000 contracts, bond contracts. Holy shit. Yeah, I mean, that's there's someone who knows about taking losses <laughs> and making money. Made two million, I think you said he made two million in a day, which given the size of the position, I'm surprised he, he probably made a lot more, but I just didn't want to say that because of tax man, IRS. Um, <laughs> but his biggest loss was five bucks. Took a hit of five million one day. Again, when you're trading sixty thousand contracts, the guy obviously uh, did take. Um, it's pretty disciplined, I think. If you're holding sixty thousand contracts, then it's funny you, know, you should some, mention that. Some book, of the days the we've had, you can do more than that. It's funny you should mention that book. It's a book that everyone should read. I think it's called well, especially the fourth installment. I, I really like. It's fun one. What? The hedge fund, or you mean yes, market one. wizards? Uh, you learn a lot about risk management and how incredibly different it is uh, for each person. Um, it's it, some people have this almost like this anti-trading style, 
So this one guy, I, I don't remember his name, he runs a hedge fund out of, I think it was Tampa, Florida, and he's, he's only able to make money trading against the market. So if the market is bullish, he's constantly short. A contrarian. Yeah, and, and, uh, <laughs> and he's so able to spot, like his skill is spotting these trends. And then uh, Jack Schwager asks him, but, but if you're spotting the trend, why don't you just trade with it? And he says, I'm unable to. So uh, he can't make money trading with the trend. He has to be a contrarian. And uh, it's, just an interesting, it's just interesting to think how much trading uh, goes with who you are. You, you just have to. So yeah. for me. Uh, and also, um, th this is uh, know yourself. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's so important. Know yourself, your personality, um, not just in terms of your character, but what you do, your day. Not everyone is a professional trader who's trading. Some, you know, people have day jobs and whatever. And therefore, if you're only ever going to put trades on or put orders in the market, then you need a trading system that accommodates that. And a number of people who don't do that, which is why, you know, I'm talking about retail traders here. Why so many people say, well, what's going to happen in the next eight hours? What's going to happen now, right here and now? Because, you know, they've got to go to work or, or whatever. Or it's the evening and that's when they want to trade. But the market, I'm afraid, the market's moving in the morning when you're at work. And therefore, you need to change your trading style or, or don't trade. Or and hire a professional trader. <laughs> Sorry? Or hire a professional. It's a skill like anything else. Yeah, it's, it was a discipline, I think. Yeah. So if it's you have work in the day, uh, I remember reading um, uh, a question from some trader and he couldn't make money and he didn't understand because he was trading in the evening in the US hours when there's almost no volatility, there's nothing happening. And he, he just didn't know what to do and like just change your either time of day you trade. So you have all these US day traders who get up at 2 or 3 in the morning yeah, and that's why. I mean, you have to. That's when the action hits. So, um, anyway, well, uh, speaking of action. timing, I, I have a, a a meeting I have to go to. So, I think we have to call it the day. Uh, so, have you done your trades for the day? Yeah, this is my trade. I mean, my, personally, uh, I have one trade, and it's uh, myself. So, uh, I can't trade markets. I don't make money like that. I'm a terrible trader. I don't have uh, that level of self-control, but what I can do is like do uh, develop a, a business or understand where things are going or whatever. Or at least that's what I think. And uh, okay, yeah, maybe yeah. that's investment, not not trading. I mean, there's lots of different well, terms for it. But we talked about um, Warren Buffett yesterday, and yeah. according, did you see the Wall Street Journal has a little piece on how much some of these people have made in 2013? 12.6 billion Warren Buffett made because he's focusing on his business, his businesses. And you know, recognize what you do and do well. And if it's yeah. um, what it's not necessarily a case of what you want to do, I mean, quite often what you want to do is something you will do well because this is you the want article to do it. here, <clears throat> yeah, because you want to do it. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean you have the right disposition. If you don't, then you need either to do something else or, or to change your disposition. Yeah, for Too me, uh, for me, this appeals to me. I mean, it's uh, um, the, the the idea of building a business. It's to me personally more fun than uh, trading. But I love trading, sort of from the sidelines. So, but when you look at like what these people are doing, they're they're changing the world, and I find that interesting. Yeah, appealing as well. Yeah, well, they're building. They're builders in that sense, and trading. But trading is also you are building something. You're building well, yourself. Well, everyone except Steve Ballmer, he doesn't build much. <laughs> it's more of a destroyer of value, really. So, no, but that's an interesting point you you have there. And actually, what you say about Warren Buffett is, in many ways, is no longer a trader. He does do some trading, but probably a better example would be George Soros. You yeah. know, George Soros, his, uh, I, I like, I've got a lot of time for George Soros. Very clever guy, very clever guy. Um, and says what he thinks. Uh, he's, he's an easy person to deal with in that sense because he is black and black and white. But uh, he's a builder, but he's also a trader. Um, there's someone I was talking the other day about his, um, 
he actually gets uh, gets quite nervous. You wouldn't have thought someone like George Soros, given his history, the amount he sold in, you know, um, the amount of size of positions he's taken. But he would um, again. It's a question of the scale of position and what that means to you, um, and what to the extent that affects you. But uh, it affected him um, allegedly. Um, wow. You know, to the effects, the size yeah, of position he that. was taking, would get nervous about position and not doing it. And, you know, the greatest way to stop being nervous about a position is to have a stop loss. Yeah. Because then I, it's I done, think, it's done, and if it's not done, it's not done. I think Black that's block. a nice little wrapper on this. Uh, time is ticking on, uh, so my trades are done for the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, let's finish it this way. The world is a very complex place. It's shades of grey. But when it comes to trading it, it should be black and white. You have your stop, you're looking for this level, you've got your risk return. A trade is uh, not necessarily, a view is not necessarily a trade. The world trading should be simple. Keep it that way. Peace, love, <laughs> happiness. <laughs>